was a teenager, I got into photography and I saved up and bought myself a really old Asahi Pentax camera. It was extremely basic, no autofocus, uh, no way of light metering, but it took pictures eventually and uh, it was a bit hit and miss. Here's a picture of a hit uh, of uh, a picture of a snowball fight, a fairly literal hit uh, at my school. A friend of mine uh, one day told me that Pentax London were looking to put on an exhibition of historic cameras and my camera was one of the models they were looking for. So Pentax offered me a top of the range professional SLR in return for my basically piece of junk. And uh, so was that a good deal for, for Pentax? No, a really bad deal if you look at value based on comparing price alone. But a great deal if you look at value in terms of the value to the two people involved in the transaction. To me, value was about the quality of pictures I could take. To Pentax, value was about the completeness of exhibition they could make. Value is in the eye of the beholder because we value something with our heart as well as our head. But what happens when the thing we give our heart to is boiled down to a single financial metric? When financial gain alone becomes uh, the thing that we focus on, then we get a very monochrome view of business. We miss out on the full color of opportunity that business has the amazing power uh, to, to be generating. There are two basic ways of looking at value within business. The grab view of business is that business is all about beating the competition, grabbing what you can for yourself. The give view of business, on the other hand, is that business is all about serving other people, giving away what you can. I've experienced both views of business in my working life. I began my career in strategy consulting for banks, and I had the Wall Street lifestyle to match. I had the, the fast car, the flashy suits, the waterfront apartment. And I experienced how intoxicating that grab view is when it's fueled by competitive, conspicuous consumption. But I also experienced a very different view when I left consulting to train to be a church minister. Uh, that's right, I, uh, I swapped my GTI for a family car and my stripy shirt for a clerical collar. I then spent 20 years leading a church in central London. Uh, the church, in fact, was only a five-minute walk away from my old consulting firm. But the message I was now presenting about it being better to give than receive and loving your neighbor as yourself seemed a million miles away from how people thought, never mind how they were transacting their business lives. The question I kept on asking is, how can these two views of value ever be brought together prevailing logic is that grab and give are competing forces. The only way through is to do trade-off decisions where both lose out to some extent. And this tension in my mind was resolved quite recently when I enrolled on an executive MBA program. I was quite a mature student. Uh, I think I increased the class average age and white hair counts considerably. <laughs> I was in a lecture on how to uh, look at new frontiers in strategic planning uh, when I suddenly realized there's another way of looking at value in business, a way that combines the positive power of the grab view with the compassion of the give view in what I call the generate view of value. Value generation is all about taking a wider look. It takes in all the goods that a company creates, as well as the cash it gains in the process. It's about re-evaluating what we mean by value and what we consider to be valuable, which led to the question that's become my passion, which is, what if we valued companies based on benefit built as well as money made? Take, for example, the Forbes list of the world's most valuable companies. It gives an accurate metric of, uh, of value based on share price and earnings.
But does a financial metric really tell us about how valuable these firms are to the world? Yes, it might tell us market value, but what about life-enhancing value? If I was to ask you to list the companies most valuable to you, what would be on your top 10? Mine would probably include uh, some of Forbes' lists, such as Apple, who provide almost constant value through their watch, iPhone, iPad, and MacBook. But I'd probably also include some lesser known firms, such as Premier Foods, who make some of my favorite desserts. Because uh, to me, dessert is the most valuable food group. So it would definitely be <laughs> on my, my list. But desserts aside, what makes something valuable to us and what makes our company valuable to others depends on where we look for our source of joy, meaning, and significance. As someone who's combined strategy consulting with church ministry, I'm fascinated by how our view of the world links to the way we add value to the world. One interesting reference point to that is the opening words of the Bible, which give a value generation view of the world. Near the beginning, the earth is described as formless and empty. And God's response to that is to form what's formless and to fill what's empty. In order for the world to operate, value needs to be generated. We don't just get, get given things on a plate. And that's why the very first command to people is to go and be fruitful and multiply. Fruitful is a forming word. It's about innovating technology, forming things into useful function. And multiply is a filling word. It's about adding and extending what's already there. Generating value is a fundamental calling of human beings. And generating value is a fundamental calling of great companies as well. I wonder what you'd say the calling of your company is and what value you're generating day by day. Well, to help uh, look at that, I've been researching for the last three years a project that I call Soulful Enterprise. I've interviewed business leaders across the world in very different business contexts and asked them lots of questions about uh, their, their business, uh, from creative uh, agencies in China to sanitation companies in Kenya, to banks in Britain, and manufacturers in Minnesota. And every time I've interviewed leaders, what I've come away with is a whole range of different types of value these businesses are creating, generating, and enjoying uh, making as, as well. That range of value can be summarized in three rings. The center circle is the value generated by the products and services a company makes and distributes. Without that value, the business has no real uh, reason for being. But that is the core of the business. But in order to provide those products, to make them and distribute them, the business needs to grow an operation. It needs to be adding value to staff as it develops staff adding value to technology as it de develops and innovates new technology, adding value to markets as it creates a distinct position within a market, extends markets uh, as, as it goes. And uh, as the business grows, so does the business's influence on the public square, its influence and impact on communities and public bodies its impact on other external stakeholders, and eventually its impact on uh, future generations. All three rings are necessary. Take, for example, the uh, outdoor apparel firm Patagonia, very well-known uh, firm for its impact in society, has lots of programs and initiatives, but it can only do those programs and initiatives because it's selling products that customers want to buy. Without that, it would have no, no impact at all. But it can only sell products that customers want to buy and continue to do that by developing staff and continuing to add value to staff, by developing new technologies, new materials, by continuing to have a distinct position within the market. Each of these aspects of value 
work together to make a sustainable business model. So if I was to ask you, where are you adding value in each of those three rings of your company, what would you say? I'll just give you a second just to think about that but for a moment. To help you to uh, answer that, I'm going to ask three diagnostic questions. And the first question is, is this. Where would your customers put your products and services on their uh, list of priorities? Question number two. How much has each member of your staff increased in skill and in well-being since joining your firm? And question three. If your firm was to disappear tomorrow, how would society miss your firm? It's exciting, isn't it, looking at value in this wider uh, way. Talking about exciting, when I was newly married, I decided to learn how to ski uh, because my wife was already a proficient skier. So uh, we booked a week in Austria. And uh, each day uh, of the, the holiday, I went from the chalet to the nursery slope right next door uh, for my beginner's classes. My view of skiing for the whole week was, was limited to a mercifully short slope that I tried to navigate on my ridiculously long skis. Well, by, by the end of the week, I'd got the hang of the basics, or I thought I had, and my wife invited me to go skiing with her. So for the first time, I got in a cable car, and we went up into the mountains, and wow, suddenly I saw skiing in a very different light. Now I could see the magnificent views. I could see all the paths to navigate, the moguls to, to go round, and best of all, the mountaintop apple strudel that I could enjoy. Why do I tell that story? Well, because I observe a lot of business leaders who are on the nursery slopes, going up and down, capturing financial value bit by bit, who've never gone up into the mountains, never seen the panorama of value that their businesses have the potential to be generating. It's easy to get tunnel visioned in business. Jesus teaches about money, uh, and he uses an Aramaic word called mammon, uh, which uh, can be defined as treasure that, uh, that becomes your heart's desire, treasure that you lean on to give you joy, meaning, and significance. The thing is, when money alone becomes your treasure, then your definition of value becomes very, very narrow. And the result of that is disordered loves that damage hearts and dehumanize organizations. But when you widen your definition of value, then also you widen the purpose of your organization. And lives become lives with true joy, deep meaning, and lasting significance, which leads to a proposition that I have. The value we generate reveals the values on which we concentrate. I'm convinced that if companies started maximizing value in this wider range of measures, the business world would be transformed overnight. I have seen many uh, highly successful companies where their profitability is deeply rooted in value generation, in an ecosystem of value. They're valued by people and they're valuable companies because they're bringing into being value day by day. This isn't uh, the preserve of the fanatical few. I believe every company should be able to call itself an impact investment. To return to my childhood camera, uh, the, the camera that Pentax gave me all those years ago, the value of it today is in the pictures I took all those years ago. Here are a couple of examples. And these uh, pictures are still on my wall of uh, my, my home to this day. They're enjoyed by people today. 
And I like to think that my old uh, camera I swapped is also in a museum somewhere uh, still and enjoyed by camera aficionados to this day. The value of something remains in the value it provides. In the same way, what value are you providing that is remaining? And is that worth giving your heart and soul to? I'm not here to convince you to become a church minister, but I am here to invite you to come with me, to look at value in this wider way beyond just the dollars in our pockets, to, to celebrate the value you're already generating as a business, and then to dream dreams of the value you can increase as you provide products that change lives, as you develop staff and, and markets, as you build communities for future generations. All it remains for me to say is, I value you listening. Thank you.